studied. It was a function of other things that I had studied that made me want to study American history. So I minored in American history. And I, I majored in economics, by the way. Um, and I cared a lot about the whole civics process, you know. Right. And look around, and we had civics in high school. Uh, everybody took a required courses uh, in, in college. And they, could, they took a course in Queens College called Contemporary Civilization. CC1, right, CC2, CC2 right. CC3. Yeah. Um, and it was you know, about the formation of uh, the modern world, about right. the formation of government and power and leadership and all the philosophies that went into those, those processes. And if you're wondering who, who we are, by the way, just to let, let you in on what's going on here, uh, that's Mary Ann Sasaki. I'm Jay Fidel. We're doing Life in the Law today. And, and if you want, you can listen to what we have to say. So what I'm saying is that since that generation, in the um, 60s, 50s and 60s, when I went to school, yeah. high school and college, uh, somewhere along the line, not only in Hawaii, but, uh, but elsewhere, um, the schools gave up civics. They gave up contemporary civilization. Um, they gave up American history. And I'm, I'm not sure what the, the kids are studying now, but I don't think they're studying those things. Well, let me say a slightly incendiary thing, which is I think that um, people don't study uh, uh, CC anymore, contemporary civilization, or uh, what, uh, what, it was called something like that in Columbia. Anyway, because that was largely a history of the Western world and how the Western world governed its... its yes, it was. And I think... It was European-oriented. European-oriented, right. And I think that as other influences have come into academia, into the canon, that is the less revered, uh, oh, it's less understood and less you, but studied. That's relatively recent. Yeah, you know, I, the emergence of Asia as a force, that was, you know, that was way after Vietnam. Right. Which was, you know, what, 20 years after the period we're talking right. about. By the way, um, this is life in the law, and, and the connection here is we're, we're talking about whether we are in a constitutional crisis and if we are, when did it start? And how serious is it? Um, what does it mean for the future? Why did it happen? I, I, I'm very afraid. What is a constitutional crisis, anyway? A constitutional crisis is something that threatens the republic to undermine the republic. I was thinking about that because I was thinking about that's how I, I came to start reading James Madison, who was the uh, drafter of the Constitution. And what did he consider a constitutional crisis? And w we're, in a f we're in a phase of history right now where I think the republic is, is uh, threatened. Uh, I mean, what's going to happen? There are people threatening to, to um, delegit... Well, first of all, let's, let's say that, that the Republicans spent many years trying to delegitimatize this president. So people want to delegitimatize the presidency. And that, right, it's more than the one person. It's the office. Yes. It's the whole notion of president That's that right. they're trying to delegitimize. That's right. I mean, they won't accept it if, if, if a person they don't like no, is elected. No, inherent in that is we don't follow the Constitution. Right. Um, and likewise, I'm jumping a little here, but inherent in the notion of we're not going to um, vote on, you know, or have hearings on your nomination for a Supreme Court judge is, is a rejection of the whole process. Right. So we're not going to follow, you know, we know we swore an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States, but we're not going to do it. No. And, as and, a group. And Congress has done that too. I mean, the House of Representatives has, has done that too consistently, as, you, as we discussed earlier, yeah. with respect to the budget. And, yeah. and now, Huh. The chickens are coming home to roost because the um, people have been so a acting in such self-serving ways and not really for the greater good, which, let's face it, that's what civics is, is right? It's, the, it's a citizenry acting, well, understanding. I need to tell you about Ben Franklin. By oh, the way, wait. there is a fabulous exhibit about Ben Franklin right now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Oh, in, yeah? In fabulous about all the paintings that were done at the time. He was very well respected, not only here, but in France. And yeah. France was the sponsor of the revolution, you know. There was pretty serious support there. But uh, Franklin was walking out of Liberty Hall where the, he, he and his buddies uh, had been discussing the Constitution, and a woman was waiting outside. She wasn't the only one. They were waiting, you know, like, like waiting for the Pope, you know, yeah, to be like nominated. Fans. The little, you know, the smoke in the chimney with that. Right. So they were waiting, and this woman ran up to Ben Franklin. She says, well, Dr. Franklin, you know, what's going to happen? What kind of government are we going to have? And Franklin said, without hesitation, 
He said, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. Right, exactly. Now, exactly. That is, How to me, that is ten, 10 feet tall, because what that tells you is you have to work at it. It doesn't come automatic. The notion, you know, of a democracy as established in this country in 1789 um, is, is a collaborative effort, mm -hmm. and everyone has to participate. Mm -hmm. We have arrived at a place where people effectively reject the notion of participating in the government. It's us and it's them. That's right. not my problem. It's right. your problem. And I think, you know, it's even... Uh, now even the Republican Party is splintering. It's further splintering because you know if you you set up this paradigm where it's uh, okay to um, just care about your own agenda, your own constituency, and that's all you care about is your constituency and being reelected and not con considering the greater good. It's it's bound to devolve and devolve into what it's devolved into now. You know, which yeah, the greater who, good. That's the civics, the greater good. Right. And and the obligation of supporting the um, you know the, the the basic notion, the basic principles, the tenets of our of our government. Right. And I think people have given that up. They now winning. That's really important. Right. It's at all costs. Not only winning your office, but winning on the point that you, you come in with. And so you would, you would violate every other obligation uh, just to win that point. Uh, and you would violate any duty to do the common good. And now I'll say something really incendiary. I think both candidates have a little bit of that problem. Well, I, I, I know Donald Trump. Donald but Trump does. I think do Hillary Clinton Hillary? too, because I think you know um, all the questions about Hillary Clinton's background, uh, questions about um, her emails, and um, she can be intentionally vague when she answers. She's been stonewalling. Yeah, that's what it really intentionally vague. Right? Well, she's a smart stonewall, but it's stonewalling right, nonetheless. Right, exactly. So, I mean, I don't see how that's not uh, not the same as wanting just wanting to win and not caring about the fabric of the of the society. She's 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 rent the fabric of society to some extent. In, yeah, no, I don't, to, in, I don't disagree in, with in you, In service Marianne. to her own goals. I think you have a point there, and it worries me. You know, I'm looking at the New York Times polls this morning. You know, I make a poll every day. I think, and it's uh, basically that she's ahead of Trump by five percent. She'll win. She'll by win. Five percent. I know, but she's going. We still have a month to go, and you know anything could happen. She could get sick. He could get sick. Some anything violent could thing happen. could happen. That's Some true. violent thing elsewhere in the world could happen, and their reactions would, you know, dictate a, maybe a new, right. a new result right. on the poll. But I, I just think it's terrible that we can say about both, both uh, of the candidates for president that we don't believe that either of them has the nation's good is not their primary. Uh, focus. I think that's so sad. I, that's such a horrible thing but to it's say. it's visible. I know. It's visible. It's, it's about me. It's about me winning. Right. And doing what I want to do. And selling as if I'm a huckster selling you my, you know, my special right. elixir. Right. Um, but it's not about me and you working together. Uh, I know she will say that. She does say that. Right. Uh, he won't even say that. It's, him, it's about him and his ego. I don't think he understands he, he, I think there's a lot, you know, you said you took American history when you were in college. Mm -hmm. I don't think he, Donald Trump has ever taken a course in American history because his understanding of how the government works is so poor. I mean, he just really doesn't even know what, what the government, he, he could do or couldn't do as president, what the government is capable of doing, what geopolitics well, requires. A couple of things working there. One is he wasn't educated about it. No. Um, he's not a lawyer. Um, but he's, he's, he's going through the, the, law, the law school of hard knocks, which is you buy the lawyers to win on any position you right. want. Just win for me. I don't care what the right is or the wrong is. Um, right. just, just make it happen for me. And that's uh, cynical beyond you know, any interpretation of the word. But cynical. he's a businessman foremost. He's not a statesman. He's not even a politician. He's, he's, never, he's never served the public in any capacity. And, you know, I think it has to be a very rare individual that can have no elected public office and then have the highest elected public office. I mean, I think you need a little experience there, you know, I, I just think, I don't know. Well, I, I, yeah, has I mean, anybody ever been elected without any, uh, well, do I don't know, but it's, if so, it's a great minority, it's unique. So, you know, how do we get here? How do we get to a place where Donald Trump can be so popular? 
Um, well, there's many factors, but let me throw some at you. Okay. And you can throw some at me. Okay. Number one is, this is all mm, edutainment, right? This is like a bad documentary that makes it, it makes itself seem real, but it, it really isn't real. Right. Uh, he isn't real. Um, the, you know, you, uh, I mean, they're, they're making this up. This is all like fiction made to look like fact. This isn't really a presidential right. campaign. Um, this is, this is um, entertainment every yeah, it's night. Like, it's like a plot, a, a plot uh, yes, driven story, right? It, yeah. The plot thickens between two people. And okay, and the press seems to be accepting of that. Although I, I have to, you know, compliment the New York Times. Um, you know, you can't always compliment them, but on this occasion, they've been consistent. They said, what is going on here? And they call him on everything they could call him on, and that's right, and that's good. Um, but, but I think people in general and lots of other newspapers, if you could call those thin rags that you see sometimes newspapers. I know. People don't read newspapers and so much. Nobody reads it. Nobody reads it. Why would you read a newspaper if you can get the news the day before? Why would you pay a dollar today when you could get it free yesterday? I know. What's the point of that? I know. So, you, you know, you read, uh, you know, in small sound bites on your, on your phone uh, or on the web. And that's the way you get the news, and you get it in small sound bites, not in any depth, not no, in no, philosophical No, no, it's not a well-considered right. uh, contextual, although there is, I think, a well-considered contextual piece coming out on Hillary Clinton in Sunday's New York Times. But um, no, there's certainly not the money for that now, and people don't absorb information that way. They absorb it by, you know how I find out stuff all the time, like all the time? Somebody on my Facebook posts it. If there's like a, well, I, this was very striking to me. There was a, a small earthquake in New York, and I was here, and somebody just said, oh, I just felt an earthquake, and like well before any newspaper, you know, ha right. had it, you know. So over time, over years and decades, you come away with, the, you know, the impression, I do, uh, maybe you too, that, that you're getting secondhand, secondhand news from the newspaper. And right. you're not getting it in depth because they can't afford investigative reporters. And if you get an investigative report, you know, of any value, that's an aberration. That's well, not the rigor. But let me say that the, um, the, the quandary or the problem that the press is finding itself in now, that's also a constitutional crisis. Because the Constitution guarantees the freedom of the press. And we, as a society, are creating an environment where the press really can't flourish. They can't flourish because there are all these, it, there's all this gossip and innuendo and individuals and people writing all kinds of stories. And the press, the press has been weakened. And I, I would, I posit oh, that, that that's a constitutional crisis but, as well. Not, but you know, I don't, I, I don't reach out to the press and say, too bad for you guys. I, I empathize and sympathize with you. I don't because they're owned by too few people. And because their standards of journalism are not what they were in the good old days. And because if, you know, you get on... But you don't you think that's, a, that's, that's a, a, not what the forefathers contemplated? No. They had a whole new view, a whole other view of it. Right. And then, you know, and then you just look, just, just sort of clean your mind out and look for a minute, for an hour, at CNN or worse, Fox. And what you will see is they have a soundbite of five words, and they throw that across the screen over and over again. And when they're done, they'll do it again and right. again all day long. Right. So you get, for example, the Donald Trump show all day long. Right. And it's their interpretation. It's those five words coming right. at you. Um, there's no depth there. Uh, there's no real interpretation there. And it, it becomes, again, a, a docudrama, but not the reality. And this is what people get, not only today and tomorrow and next week, but all their lives. So they're not trained in American history or civics. Um, so they, you know, they, they don't read real in-depth materials, mm -hmm. uh, and what they are getting is this kind of really thin veneer stuff. Twitter. Okay. Twitter. It they're is, getting news from Twitter. It, it, it defines them. It, this, this source of information defines them. Not only does it define them, but it defines everyone, you know, or most right. people in the country. Right. So what you have is a, is, a, is a wild horse kind of electorate that is uninformed and probably confused. Now that's a constitutional crisis. Right, I agree with right, you. Right, 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 right. They're they're uninformed, confused, and uh, angry. Right, angry about about often the wrong things. So you know what's happening is it's the the rules of the rules that Ben Franklin was talking about are going slack. That's right. And the government can't work 
without, you know, a, um, a press doing its job. The government can't work if people are not going to you know, perform their duty. Right. We have like 42 percent um, voting rate here in this state. Other states are also in bad shape. That's but They're not doing their duty. I came back from Portugal and I, I, I said to them, you know, it's really you know, curious. I, they follow this election very closely. Mm -hmm. right? Um, well, said, because we're a model for the world. Well, we're going to affect them. What happens well, this election will affect them, and they know it. Uh, and we can talk about that. But um, you know what they said? What they said was, um, if I don't vote here in Portugal, I get fined, and I have to pay Is the that fine. Ter that's terrific. Yeah, it's terrific. Yeah. You know, I mean, back in the old days, it was it was a great honor to vote. Right. In exactly. fact, you had to own property and. And there were all these limitations right. where you could not vote if you didn't have this right. and that. Now it's just the other it's way. It's self disenfranchisement. People are woefully disenfranchising. They don't themselves. understand how important it is. No. Well, I think they think it, my nothing will ever change. My voice can't change things. But the thing is, if they understood themselves as part of a larger group, maybe they would understand that you can change things not alone, but as part of a larger group. I agree with you, and I think this calls for a discussion of Christmas future. Okay. A Christmas future, you know, an understanding of a Christmas future will help us perform our duties now. We're going to take a short break. We're going to come back, and you'll see us continue this conversation right into the, you know, the shocking aspect of Christmas future. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tyler Sabota, and I was actually a guest host on Carl Campagna's Think Tech Hawaii show, Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. And I think you should tune in every Wednesday to find find out more about what it is. That's all. Take care. Aloha, everyone. I hope you've been watching Think Tech Hawaii. But I'm here to invite you to watch me on Viva Hawaii every Monday at 3 p.m. I'm waiting for you. Mahalo. Hi, I'm Stacy Hayashi, and you can catch me on Mondays at 11 on Think Tech Hawaii. Stacy to the rescue. See you then. Aloha. My name is Richard Emery and I host Condo Insider. We talk about issues facing the Condo Association throughout Hawaii and talk about solutions. When you think about it, about one third of our population lives in some form of common interest real estate. We broadcast every Thursday at 3 p.m. Please tune in, tune in and thank you, aloha. Okay, 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 enough of that. Let's get back to the real deal here. First thing is, we're not just talking about the millennials. Uh, we got to clarify that. No, we're not talking, we're talking about, about you know everything. I went I went door to door for a, for a can candidate a few years ago, and I found an extraordinary number of people didn't want to talk to me, and not because they didn't like me, uh, not because they didn't like one candidate or the other. That what they said to me in my face, they said, "I don't care about any of that. I don't vote anymore. There's I'm not no involved. There's no belief in the system. Leave There's me no alone. belief in the system. Yeah, I'll take the benefits. I'll take the security. You know, I'll take the social security, but I I'm not going to do anything for it." Just leave me alone. It's just over my head, or, or I have, de I have shoved off, okay. And so, um, you know, the point should be made that it's not just the twenty-year-olds who are backing oh, out of no, the deal. Oh no, not at all. It's all kinds of demographic groups yeah. are backing out of the deal. You know, if I were to lay the blame, I'd lay the blame almost at the baby boomers because they were the me first generation, they were the me generation, and I think they did a lot to dismantle um, the. Uh, institutions, codes, rituals, whatever you want to say, of, of the United States. And they, with tearing some of those things down, you know, they tore some of the bad things down, civil rights and sexism, but they tore some of the good stuff apart, too. I yep. mean, you know, yep. they did. Yep. So, but, you know, I don't think it's the millennials. I think the millennials are just frustrated. I think we have to also, you know, examine the technology and uh, what do we call it, the organizational development that has gone into helping a candidate run for office. In a word, the PR function. function. Right. You know, PR is everything. There's a movie with Sandra Bullock about how she goes to Chile. I and saw that she movie. consults, you know, for one of the candidates against the others. And right. She does all these magic tricks, and it's all unfair. It's not democratic at all, and at the end of the day, the guy is a bum. Uh, and it's shocking what happens after campaigning on, you know, all these lofty principles, immediately after elected, you know, he does something bizarre. Sort of the way Donald Trump threatened. Yeah. I mean, if I'm elected, I'm going to throw Hillary in jail. Yeah, that's, that's that wonderful. was a bridge too far. That's out of Paraguay. But, you know, speaking of, of Sandra Bullock, I, I just want to say, 
You know, out of this whole miasma, Kellyanne Conway, um, Clinton's advisor, has been, uh, she's done an unbelievable job. I disagree with everything she says, but she has been absolutely unbelievable with respect to trying to uh, remediate his actions and his behavior. I just wanted to say that I, I, I'm a big fan of hers. I think, you know, I, although I disagree, she's totally Republican. I disagree with her entire positions. But she's the person in the, in, in the uh, Trump campaign that's the Sh Sandra Bullock character. She's crafting the I message. saw her. I saw her, and I, I, you know, this is like he said, she said. I saw her, and I felt her, and I looked deeply into the television set to see what she was like, and I concluded she was a liar on everything she was saying. She was the same thing as he is. Oh, I, I, She would I, never yeah. admit to the truth on anything. No, she, no, she, t she's very deft. She's very, very deft, and, but it's just that, to watch somebody do their job in the way that she does it, I just find. She's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. You know, so we have a profession out there that, you know, perverts the truth in favor of winning the candidate. Oh, absolutely. And th that's what's happened. I, I mean, it's really sad. And this is an American institution. We have invented this one. Okay, but let's talk about Christmas future. Yes, let's talk and about And the Christmas reference future. to Christmas future, by the way, is Charles Dickens. Okay, and it's a Christmas carol, Christmas, a, a Christmas story, I think, right. with the name of the... And it's, you know, Scrooge, and, Scrooge. and Bob, Bob Cratchit, Cratchit. You know, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, in, in order to make Scrooge fully understand, uh, they take him, the book Dickens takes him for a walk into the future, mm -hmm. and he gets a chance to see what's going to happen if he continues his bad acts in the future. Yes. And it scares him it's so much very scary. that he changes his ways. Well, I, I think people in this country really should go for a walk into the future. Um, they should see what's going to happen if this continues. And if, it, you know, if it's not a full-blown constitutional crisis now, as I, I believe it is, um, it will be. So what is it like? Uh, this is a hard question, Marianne. It is. What is it like? Take me forward five years. And if this kind of thing continues, I mean, all you got to do is look and see if Trump gets elected. What's going to happen? Uh, you know, I, I don't uh, You know, the, what, I, uh, what comes to mind is um, 1984 and Big Brother. I mean, the, there's going to be... It's, all TV. It's going to be all talking heads on TV, no real people. Uh, a tremendous, you have to have a buy-in into the mess, a message, no discussion. It'll be, it'll, I, I mean, it, there'll be no genuine intellectual, dis public intellectual I think discourse. people don't realize the power of the president. You know, if he wants to do something radically unconstitutional, radically in violation of all the laws and the principles of the country, he can. It's, it's up to someone else to stop him. Right. Other people have to so stop him. So who's like going to stop him? Saturday you know? Night Massacre. His own attorney general is not going to stop him. It'll, it'll have to be, you know, pitchforks. I, I mean, how, how do you stop him? Uh, the courts will have to, you know, act. Um, people will have to go and seek relief in court. Uh, I, I talked to one guy, and I won't mention his name, but he's at the State Department. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he, was, he was asked in a public, in a public discussion, um, you know, what would happen if uh, Donald Trump were elected. And uh, he said, oh, you're all worried about that. Don't be worried about that. Why not? Why not? Well, if Donald Trump is elected, two weeks later, he'll be impeached. Really? Really? You know, impeachment doesn't, is not so easy. No, it's not so easy. And I don't think of that as the solution. I mean, it's certainly not the solution to the problem. It, you know, I mean, if people don't have any faith in, in the government now and I mean, it would just be so undermining to the uh, authority of the, of the government and the people's buy-in. What's the right word, buy-in? Uh, belief in the, in the government. I yeah. just, you know. Right. Confidence in the administration of justice. And, you know, once that begins to roll down the hill, mm, well, what's it, it catches it fire on everything. Today. Can you see it going back? That's my problem. My problem is I'm not sure what's ha going to happen in the future, but I know I think it will be bad because I don't see anybody coming along that genuinely wants, maybe Bernie Sanders did to some extent, but that genuinely wants to... Do the in a, common good. Right, in a self-sacrificing way, stand up for what's right. I mean, all these Republicans that left Trump, they all stood up with what they thought was not right, but it was not in a self-sacrificing way. Somebody who, a hero, a hero, a government, you know, somebody, I, yeah, I, yeah. but I, do you see that? I don't see that. 
Who? No, no, I, I agree with you. I, I, I see it getting worse before it gets better. Yes. And, I, and, I, and the, the possibility, the room, you know, the elbow room to get worse is huge. I mean, he could go, he could make an agenda. Well, he has made a kind of crazy agenda. The wall, he could actually try to do the wall. Yeah. Um, he could actually appoint a special prosecutor to go after her. Yeah. Um, he could actually push the button or get into a fight with any number of, of states right. that he doesn't or like. Or round up Muslims, innocent Muslims, and, and you know, right. and turn them as we did. Or with make, the a, make a tax break that favors the rich, you know, and well, he'll definitely do effectively that. bankrupt the country. Um, I mean, he will, he will make people very unhappy, and they right. will be in the streets. You can imagine all the things that he could do right out of the box that would destroy the fabric of our country and roll back all the gains we've made in terms of human rights over the past 200 and some odd years. Right. It's just, it's amazing how quickly that could happen. Right. And we would be victims, all of us. Right. You know? And, yeah, yeah. And I have to say something about the um, uh, implicit sexism in this, uh, in this race. It, it, you know, I, I, it's so h hard to believe that uh, the first woman running for president has to face these kinds of this kind of behavior on the other side. It's hard enough to run for president. It's hard enough to have a cogent foreign policy, a uh, cogent domestic policy. But but this woman is she's she's having to defend herself as as a woman. I think she's doing a good job. I think she is. I do. I think I'm she, not so sure. You don't think so? Yeah. Why not? I think she could have done better on Sunday night. And oh, she I could have done better on Sunday night. Yeah. But I mean, it, he was really you know, pulling her, pushing her all over the lot, and she didn't have an answer except to make a, a funny-looking smile. But he, you know, I don't know how I would react with his little pre-debate conference and then these women that, you're, that have been your adversaries for many, many years sitting in the audience, and maybe she's only human, and she, she you know, really couldn't... Maybe so. Uh, but, you know, I, I want somebody strong. And, then, and, the, and the problem with that debate is if, if you're the kind of person who doesn't care about the issues intellectually, and you're looking for a strong person, a macho person, some right, people are right. looking exactly for that, right? right? You're going to pick him. Well, he, he uh, appeals you know, to Ignore that. the substance of what he said, and you're going to pick the strength. Yeah, he and you're not going to gonna see her as all that strong as, as he is. But, you know, to get to the closing point on this, okay. it's not Trump, actually. No. It's, it's all the factors and the people and the changes in our American society that have allowed Trump to get this far. I think that's right. I mean, I think there's a lot of people on the left who don't realize that big banks, so that their actions help to disenfranchise this group of pitchfork wielding, you know, tea bag, tea parties, Donald Trump supporters, you know, anti government destroy the government, the government's rigged. I mean, I think that, you know, the elite has a, a big part to play. And they, their behavior I agree with you, has, I, has, 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 uh, it's, it's damaged the working man. And well, he's a demagogue. I mean, he's Huey Long demagogue Huey Long. and worse. Absolutely. And he's a phenomenon Absolutely. that should have gone out of our world, you know, a hundred years right. ago in the development of this country. But He's back. Well, we've rec well, recreated the class structure that enables somebody to be a Huey we Long did. and uh, we appeal appeal to to that that person. So the system is really not perfect, and the system had better find its key really quickly. The system had better cure itself of whatever ails it to allow him to have gotten this far. Well, you know, I think it goes back to what we were saying that y people have to un not do what bankers. She can't do what's just the absolute best for bankers and without a care about the co common good of America. People have to put the, a, a greater idea ahead of their own personal right. desires, right. their greed. It's not, so their easy. greed. it's not so easy when you have a culture of greed going on on Wall Street as we saw in 2008. But I would not say to you, go out and vote. I would not say that. I would say, read the newspapers, read everything you can get your hands on. Learn about this. Have your kids learn about this. Right. Participate. Right. Connect with our civic society. Be a real participant. So voting stupid is not helpful, ladies and gents. You've got to vote smart. Yeah, you have to be informed. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Mary. Oh, it's always, always, always terrific. Always, always the best. <laughs>